Hello, this is the program Be Healthy, and I'm the host, Dr. Vladimir Levitin. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. Michael Fellings, uh, professor of neurosurgery uh, at University of Toronto and uh, recipient of many, many awards. Uh, we're continuing our conversation about spinal cord injuries. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, in the last program, we finished talking about uh, undifferentiated stem cells and their potential into transformation into any kind of cells. How is it achieved? So uh, this is a, a breakthrough that's occurred in the last 10 years. And this is what's referred to as induced pluripotent stem cell technology. And an, and an advance that's also occurred is called direct reprogramming. So in a nutshell, we now have the technology to take any cell in the body. So for example, a small piece of skin. We can culture this in a dish. We can introduce special factors called transcription factors. We can then make a stem cell and using special culture protocols, we can make any stem cell in the body, including neural stem cells that can be used to regenerate nerve tissue in the brain and the spinal cord. Is it done in vitro or in vivo, like uh, outside the body or, and the, then introduced? Yeah, so the culturing is done outside the body. So what we might do uh, from, a, say, a, a person who has a spinal cord injury, we would get a small piece of skin, a punch biopsy, we would then, outside the body, in the lab, culture this in a dish, and then introduce the factors. We would then expand the population of the cells. Um, and then when we have enough of these cells, we could then microsurgically reintroduce those into the damaged area of the brain or spinal cord to try to uh, influence regeneration. What is the role of neuroplasticity? of uh, non-damaged cells expanding and taking over the function of the damaged area? So neuroplasticity refers to where uh, undamaged nerve cells send out connections. We call those synaptic connections. And depending on the type of injury and how severe it is and which circuits in the brain and spinal cord are involved, Plasticity can be one of the mechanisms by which people can show some degree of recovery. So, for example, after a stroke or after a spinal cord injury, there is some plasticity that, that can occur. Unfortunately, when the damage is severe, the amount of plasticity is usually not sufficient to produce a significant recovery of function. Now, one of the opportunities, though, is to look at molecular therapies to try to enhance the amount of endogenous plasticity that can occur. What is the role of peripheral stimulation uh, to kind of uh, excite the damaged area? Potentially, peripheral stimulation can be a strategy that might be used to activate circuits. So an example of this that's currently uh, being studied in um, uh, clinical trials in the States is uh, the use of electrical stimulation uh, that's being applied actually to the spinal cord directly uh, in the lumbar area to activate the circuits that control movement in the legs. And in uh, early phase clinical studies, there have been some promising results with that. So where patients have recovered the partial uh, use of their lower limbs, even when they're paralyzed from a severe injury. And uh, they recover the use, meaning they can actively move uh, the extremities? Yeah, so there is some active uh, movement that, uh, that occurs. Now, what is remains to be seen though is can this be applied in most people with an injury and can it recover function to the extent where people might be able to stand or walk in the generative uh, 
myelopathies. Uh, how, uh, how important to keep active, to keep functioning, to do exercises, etc.? It's very important. So um, uh, physiotherapy, rehabilitation therapy, exercise is, of course, very important for one's health. And when someone has a spinal cord condition, let's say that it's a patient that I've operated on to try to remove the pressure on the spinal cord, we will always prescribe a rehabilitation program, either as an inpatient or as an outpatient. And the reality is that it's really a lifelong process um, uh, of exercise and to, be, and to be active. One can strengthen weakened muscles, but it's also important to maintain what one has because uh, very often people with cervical myelopathy are middle-aged or older and we always have to fight the aging process that occurs, and the deterioration that, occur, that, that occurs. And if you have a myelopathy, you're more vulnerable to this. And so you have to work very actively um, at, a, at a physical therapy uh, program to prevent this deterioration. People with scoliosis, uh, hyperkyphosis, etc., are they more susceptible to myelopathy? So there is no f correlation. Patients who have uh, what we refer to as a deformity of the spine, uh, particularly if it is what we call a kyphosis, which is where you're stooped forward, uh, and especially if it's in the neck, are more susceptible to developing pressure on the spinal cord. And that can be a, a, a tricky management challenge for uh, the doctor to uh, sometimes to sort out, but it is important to recognize uh, this clinical situation and to make the diagnosis earlier, and then that will enhance uh, getting an improved outcome for the patient. Compression fractures, anterior body, do they affect uh, the potency of the canal? Uh, sometimes compression fractures, which can occur either from trauma or sometimes in people who are osteoporotic, um, usually won't cause spinal cord damage, fortunately, but they can, especially if there's bone tissue that goes back into the spinal canal. We call that a burst fracture because uh, the fracture has burst back into the spinal uh, canal. So one needs to be aware uh, of this, and that can be picked up on a CAT scan or MRI study. Uh, hypothermia as a treatment or prevention of secondary cascade, is it being used uh, right now? So cooling or hypothermia has been around for millennia. And it's a first aid treatment. If you injure yourself, you cool it. The challenge is that um, in, for certain um, body parts, such as a brain injury or a spinal cord injury, it's hard to deliver local hypothermia. And so we cool the whole body. So that can be tricky because the hypothermia, when you cool the whole body, has some positive effects and some side effects as well. Um, for uh, severe strokes, um, hypothermia is used um, uh, clinically and does result in improved For outcomes. the ischemic, ischemic strokes or for hemorrhagic strokes as well? Mainly for the strokes that occur after a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a severe heart attack and there's been a period of time when the brain hasn't had enough oxygen, we will use uh, hypothermia to try to improve the outcomes. And does it show some promise? There, are, there is promise with this. And um, that, that type of uh, uh, research um, uh, is, not, is not new. So there's classic studies from the 1960s uh, showing uh, that there were positive results. The challenge has been that the technology to deliver that hypothermia uh, wasn't as advanced as it is uh, now. And so it was being looked at in the 60s and 70s and it was abandoned. 
But now there's been a resurgence of interest in the technology, largely because the engineering is better and the surgical techniques are better, the anesthetic techniques are better. And so there's a lot of promise and hope with that kind of an approach. Uh, myelopathies happen mostly degenerative myelopathy in the cervical spine. Uh, why do not, they do not happen in the lumbar spine because of the size of the canal? And what's the difference between, let's say, cauda equina syndromes and lumbar syndromes with the myelopathy? Sure. So myelopathy can occur anywhere along, along the spine. It occurs most commonly in the cervical area because the neck is so mobile and the discs are particularly vulnerable to, degener to degeneration and because we're dealing with a spinal cord that is eloquent. That means it controls a lot of important functions such as your, your hand function as, as well as the walking. Myelopathy can affect the thoracic spine as well, but it's less common because the thoracic spine is fairly rigid and is protected by the rib cage. But degeneration can, can occur. I recently operated on a patient who had quite severe degenerative myelopathy in the thoracic uh, spine. The lumbar area is spinal more- Spinal canal, uh, spinal cord finishes. Yes, the spinal cord typically uh, finishes at around the L1 level, upper lumbar level. So in the lower part of the spinal canal, the lumbar area, there's a lot of space, one, and number two, you're not dealing with the spinal cord, you're dealing with the individual nerves and they're exiting at each level and there's more room. But uh, people can still run into trouble due to degeneration of, of the uh, discs and compression on the, on the uh, uh, lumbar uh, plexus, um, the nerves in the uh, cauda equina, which exits the uh, spinal cord. Typically, this causes a, a, a symptoms that we call spinal stenosis. Um, and this is where people um, notice quite significant leg pain. It can be in one leg or typically both legs, particularly when people are standing or walking. And if the symptoms are significant enough, we will operate on those patients to release uh, the pressure on the, um, on the nerves. Uh, leg cramps, are they a symptom of uh, any lumbar dysfunction? Or it's because sometimes people don't have pain, but they have severe cramps. Well, it can be um, a, a, one of the symptoms that can occur with problems in the lumbar uh, spine. The leg cramps usually, fortunately, are not due to that. They, there can be other things that be related to that. Uh, very often dehydration, uh, people um, haven't taken enough salts during the day, um, and, and so on and so forth. That, that can cause the cramps. But the cramps can occasionally occur due to other medical problems. They may occur as a complication of diabetes, they may occur because there's not uh, a good blood supply to the legs, or sometimes they may occur because there are nerve problems as, um, as well. There are other reasons for myelopathy, like tumors. Yes, yes, for sure. So um, uh, anything that can cause pressure on the uh, uh, spinal cord, including an infection, a tumor, can cause myelopathy. Sometimes the tumors uh, occur outside the spinal cord or rarely even involving the nerves of the spinal cord itself. And how prevalent is that? Well, the most common type of tumor that affects the spine is uh, what's called a spinal metastasis. So this is where people have a tumor in the body that's spread to the spine. And um, that can occur uh, in people who have cancer. So if someone who has a history of cancer and they're presenting with neck pain or neurological symptoms, we worry about metastatic spine. So this is the first thing to rule out. The first thing to exclude. So that's one of the more common uh, causes. Tumors involving the nerves of the spinal cord 
uh, such as a meningioma, which involves the meninges, or a schwannoma, which comes from the peripheral nerve tissue, are the two of the most common tumors that occur inside the uh, covering of the spinal cord. Meningioma is usually benign. The meningioma and the schwannoma are both benign tumors. But they still can have a pressure on the spinal cord. They definitely can, can cause that, yes. And you can see it on the MRI. Is there like definitive findings or it's still the art of diagnosis? These tumors are very readily seen on the MRI scan. And their effect is readily seen as well. Yes, generally it is. So by the time the patients come to diagnosis, it's clear that they have problems related to spinal cord function. You were saying that uh, people uh, sometimes can mistake uh, uh, um, myelopathy for the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, peripheral and nerve entrapment, but could it be combination, both present at the same time? Right, so um, uh, people are very aware of carpal tunnel yes. syndrome. People are less aware of cervical myelopathy. If people have bilateral symptoms in both hands, you need to be aware of the possibility of cervical myelopathy and to do the clinical testing in the MRI studies to, to rule that out. Some people have what's called a double crush syndrome. syndrome, where you have a problem in the peripheral nerve and you have a problem here in the spinal cord. Uh, a common patient group that has this are people who've had a spinal cord injury because um, these people are often, um, they're, they're using their wheelchairs, there's a lot of strain and stress on the, on the arms and upper extremities. So we will often see a combination of problems here, either at the wrist, carpal tunnel, or at the elbow called the cubital tunnel affecting the ulnar nerve, as well as in the neck. And uh, the double crush syndrome, uh, one of theories that it affects axonal flow and makes peripheral uh, nerves more susceptible to the uh, development of lesions, injuries, etc. Yeah, it's correct. So um, the um, uh, another theory is that um, if you have compression in the spinal, uh, spinal cord, there are fewer nerve fibers that are functioning properly. And then if you have compression here, people will be more susceptible to developing the subsequent symptoms. Another of your areas of interest is cerebral palsy. Yes. Uh, what are the advances in treatment of the cerebral palsy? So cerebral palsy is the commonest um, uh, birth-related uh, physical uh, disability, a neurodevelopmental disability. And it occurs in uh, roughly two in a thousand uh, childbirths. It's been commonly thought that this occurs because there's been a problem with the childbirth and so on. And that can occur sometimes, but it most commonly occurs uh, in utero. And um, the, the child's brain is, has not received enough oxygen. In uh, most children, the, uh, the degree of brain injury is milder. It often is, is, is uh, more challenging to detect than one might think. Um, and there are now advances that are occurring in the early detection and diagnosis of cerebral palsy because earlier intervention, pot potentially with earlier physical therapy, may improve the outcomes for, um, uh, for kids. The two commonest types of cerebral palsy are a type of um, uh, injury that results in what's referred to as spastic diplegia. This is where there's increased muscle tone in the legs and there's problems with walking. And, the, and another common type is what's called hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And this is where there's been a reduction in the blood supply to one side of the brain. 
and then uh, typically then the opposite side shows uh, paralysis or reduced um, um, uh, muscle function. That's typically related uh, to a type of a stroke that occurs to the brain around the type of uh, uh, injury, around the type, time of birth. So um, our laboratory is currently studying hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And we've been examining the possibility of using neural stem cells to uh, regenerate the uh, injured brain. And this has been work that's been funded through the Ontario Brain Institute, as well as the Kids Brain Health uh, Network Center of Excellence nation nationally. And the results are very promising, at least in the, uh, uh, in the animal models. And so the hope is that we'll eventually potentially transfer that knowledge into clinical trials. And that would be applicable uh, to just children or adults who are living with uh, cerebral palsy? Initially, uh, it would likely have the biggest impact earlier on in an individual's life. And this is to take advantage of the inherent plasticity of the child's brain. The further you go out from the injury, the more challenging it becomes to repair that injury because the circuits can degenerate and then also there's scarring that can form around the area of the injury that, and these factors can limit the effective regeneration that can occur. And one of the most devastating diseases I've ever heard of is amyotrophic lateral sclero sclerosis. Basically, patient loses control of all their muscles while staying absolutely clear-minded. Is there any hope, any light at the end of the tunnel? Right. Well, ALS... Uh is uh, certainly a devastating uh, uh, condition. Stephen Hawking is perhaps one of the most uh, well-known individuals who recently succumbed from the effects of, of But AL he AL was very unusual case. Unusual because he lived many years. Most people, unfortunately, pass away within a few years of the diagnosis. And ALS uh, typically involves the... Um, the motor nerve cells in the spinal cord and also in the, in the lower parts of the brain. And it tends to be progressive. We don't know the cause of it. There are some theories that perhaps viruses may play a role in the advancement of this. So stem cells um, are thought to be one of the hopes, potentially, that can be applied in people with uh, ALS. And there are early phase clinical trials that have been going on in the States looking at the use of neural stem cells to try to repopulate the lost nerve cells in critical areas of the spinal cord to try to improve the function of, uh, of patients. And some of the early results look promising, but it's still too early to tell if we'll be able to, to translate that knowledge into effective treatments. Any ALS. pharmacological advances? Well, the, 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 the pharmacological advance that um, is used now in clinical practice is the use of Riliazol, the sodium glutamate uh, blocker. And uh, Riliazol slows down the rate of nerve cell degeneration in, in ALS. The effects are modest, uh, so it's not a cure, and, uh, but it does slow down the rate of nerve cell degeneration. And um, as we had discussed earlier, we're um, uh, taking this drug, the ALS drug, Riliazol, and we're now studying this in patients with traumatic and non-traumatic forms of spinal cord injury. And the results there are looking very promising. And another question, maybe it's not exactly in the... Uh course of our conversation, but uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, lately, there have been uh, opinions that, you know, the whole research of Alzheimer's has been somehow skewed towards uh, one way where it should have been uh, done different way. What is your opinion on it? Well, Alzheimer's is... Um, uh, a, a, a diagnosis which is particularly devastating. And uh, it, it's, 
it's a concern for all of us because uh, the lifespan of individuals is increasing and we have figured out improved treatments for heart disease, prevention of stroke. People are living longer and they're healthier. Uh, but Alzheimer's can rob people of the cognitive function and who they are even when people are, are healthy. So it's a form of a neurodegenerative disease, similar in concept to Parkinson's disease. What causes the degeneration of cells in, in critical areas of the brain to cause Alzheimer's disease is not clear. And there's been intensive research that's been going on, and there have been a number of, of, of theories that have been involved with this. And to date, the clinical trials with therapies for Alzheimer's disease have been somewhat disappointing, to be candid. But there have been a lot of advances that have occurred in um, our knowledge. Now, potentially, regenerative medicine, including neural stem cells, might present a potential solution for this particular uh, problem. And it's one that I think is a particularly uh, attractive one because one might potentially be able to engineer neural stem cells that are specific for the patient and targeted to the particular area of the brain that's degenerated in Alzheimer's disease. And personally, this is an area of research that I would like to see expanded because I think this shows great promise for the future. How far are we from the practical implementation of the stem cell techniques in treatment of uh, neurodegenerative and traumatic diseases? Well, I think the first advances will likely occur in spinal cord injury. And the, the, the reason is that the injury is so devastating and that I think patients and their physicians want this treatment. And there's been intensive research that's occurred over the last two decades targeting spinal cord injury. And the hope would be that if we see positive effects in spinal cord injury, we can then more rapidly transfer that knowledge into other areas. And so I think the first advances will occur in spinal cord injury. And as we speak now, there are intensive efforts in early phase clinical trials. Now, trying to predict the outcome, boy, if I could do that, you know, we, you know, none of us can always predict the future. And there's always the hope that there can be disruptive technologies that might further advance Leap the field. Break, break what I can say is that the, um, the field of regenerative medicine is now advanced to the stage where we have real science that presents real hope for patients. It will require validation. The trials are occurring now. If the trials are showing positive effects, we could potentially be looking at treatments that could be uh, in the clinic within five to, five to 10 years. It really depends though on what the effects show. What is also required is that we continue to need investment in the basic science to move this forward because um, no matter what the effect will be in the patient's it, it, it will likely initially be small effects. And then how do we learn from that to make a better type of technology? And that's why we, we need both the clinical research, but we need to continue to invest strongly in the basic research. So on this hopeful note, we'll say thank you to Dr. Michael Fellings, a neurosurgeon, professor of neurosurgery, scientist and great person who brings uh, dreams of the people of independence after the spinal cord injury to, fru to fruition. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was our program, Be Healthy, and I am the host, Dr. Vladimir Levitin. Thank you. Thank you.